I'm Roy Miller uh, from the state of Delaware, and I'm serving as the board chair for Coastal Sharks. I'd like to welcome you this morning. We have an agenda. Are there any additions or corrections to the agenda as proposed for today's meeting? Seeing none, um, we have proceedings in our information packet from the October 2017 Coastal Shark Management Board meeting. Are there any corrections or additions to those minutes? Seeing none, I presume they're approved as, as provided to you. At this point in time, I'd like the opportunity to offer public comment for anything that is, any item that is not on our um, printed agenda for today. Kirby, was there a sign-up sheet? Any names on that sign-up sheet? Um, I will make the offer, is, is there anyone who wanted to make public comment at this time who did not have an opportunity to put their name on the sign-up sheet? Seeing no hands, we'll proceed. There'll be opportunities for public comment, particularly when we get to possible action items. I'll provide additional opportunity for public comment. All right, first of all, I think we should go on to agenda item four, which is a review of the North Atlantic shortfin mako stock assessment. NOAA Fisheries Highly Migratory Species Emergency Rule Measures and Amendment 11. And for that discussion, I'm going to start off by calling on Carol Brewster Geis. Carol? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hello, everybody. My name is Carol Brewster Geis. For those of you who do not know me, I work in the Highly Migratory Species Management Division of NOAA Fisheries. I am joined today by a number of colleagues in the back, so if you have questions after the presentation that aren't answered to your satisfaction, we can help answer them. So I am going to talk about three things in this presentation. The first thing is what the stock status is. We have a new stock assessment. The second thing is an emergency interim final rule that we are that is currently in effect. And the third thing will be Amendment 11, which is looking at the long term and how to implement measures for shortfin mako. So starting with management history and stock status, I'm sure many of you know we manage shortfin mako sharks as part of the Pelagic Shark Group. Over the years, um, the quota for the Pelagic Shark Complex has changed. In 2008, there was the first ICAT stock assessment for North Atlantic shark and mako shark. That found the species was not overfished, but overfishing was occurring. As a result, in 2010, we encouraged the live release of short fin mako shark and agreed to work internationally to stop overfishing. In 2012, ICAT assessed the species again and found overfishing was not occurring. Uh, we continued to encourage the live release of shortfin mako. So that's where we were up until this past summer. In terms of catches, U.S. catches are about 11% of all the catches of North Atlantic shortfin mako sharks. So this graph shows the top five countries that uh, catch shortfin mako sharks. Spain is the top throughout the entire time series. Portugal was second around 2010, but by 2016, Morocco had uh, exceeded Portugal's catches. The U.S. has always been in about fourth place. In terms of U.S. catches, so this is just us, it is a very important species, both commercially and recreationally, where recreational and commercial catches are about equally split. Um, in terms of the stock assessment, this was done last summer. It had some new significant changes. <coughs> Excuse me, allergies, so I apologize for my throat and my coughing. Um, it had a new model structure, so they used stock synthesis, which is the assessment that most of the shark assessments are going toward nowadays. 
It, of course, had a longer time series than the last one in 2012. It used sex-specific biological parameters and updated the length compositions and had new satellite tagging data. So the graphs over on the right-hand side, the top one is the catch indice going through time. The middle one is the fishing mortality. As you can see, it increased quite dramatically more recently. And then the bottom one is the biomass. This is the COBE plot and the main statistics determining overfished and overfishing is occurring. As you can see, the majority of the, the dots are all in that red quadrant, which indicates overfished and overfishing is occurring. As a whole, the stock assessment found that catches across all nations were between 3,600 and 4,700 metric tons whole weight per year. <coughs> and that catches needed to be reduced by 72 to 79 percent in order to prevent further population declines, and that basically we need to reduce landings to zero, or total allowable catch, so not just landings, all catch, to zero, to rebuild the stock by 2040. So that's the result of the stock assessment. Pretty dramatic uh, reductions are needed. ICAP met and adopted this assessment back in November. They then came up with an ICAP recommendation 1708. Now, to be clear, recommendation in ICAP parlance is not something you should or could do. It is something that the U.S. is obligated to do under the Atlantic Tunis Convention Act. Um, in ICAP parlance, a resolution is something that we could possibly do, but a recommendation we are required to do. So in this recommendation, the main point was to maximize live releases. There were a number of derogations in that recommendation. The two that are most applicable to U.S. fisheries is that you can retain shortfin mako sharks in limited circumstances if it is dead at haulback and there is either an observer on board or electronic monitoring to verify that it was dead. And then if there is uh, males are greater than 180 centimeters fork length and females are greater than 210 centimeters fork length. So ICAT also agreed that this coming November it will review the first six months of this year to see if these measures are working to prevent overfishing. And in 2019, they'll evaluate the effectiveness of all the measures and come up with a rebuilding plan. So what did NOAA Fisheries do once we got the results of the assessment? We did determine the stock to be overfished and overfishing occurring, knowing that ICAT is looking at those measures and from the first six months of this year, we implemented an emergency interim final rule that went into effect on March 2nd. In that final rule, we have essentially two measures, one for the commercial fishery and one for the recreational fishery. For the commercial fishery, we require that all pelagic longline fishermen release short makos that are live, and they are allowed to keep the ones that are dead, and this is because our pelagic longline fishery is already required to have electronic monitoring on board for bluefin tuna. So we are, are using that system for short fin mako now. Any other commercial gear types are required to release all short fin mako, live or dead. And we estimate that this will reduce U.S. commercial landings by about 75%. In the recreational fishery, we have increased, <coughs> excuse me, increased the recreational minimum size from 54 inches to 83 inches for short fin mako sharks. Um, this matches that larger 210 centimeter fork length size for females. We did not split it, as the recommendation said we could, between male and female, primarily because when we did that, we estimated the reduction would only be about 50 percent, whereas moving up to the larger uh, 210 size limit, uh, we estimate we'll have an 83 percent reduction. And keep in mind, we're, keep, we're trying to aim between 72 and 79 percent. 
So that is the emergency rule. The emergency rule lasts until August. We have a possibility of extending it for six months. In the long term, we are working on Amendment 11 and are currently in public comment in a scoping phase for that. Amendment 11 will try to implement management measures to address the overfishing and help rebuild shortfin mako sharks. We're looking at a number of options that I'm going to go through really quickly. They are for commercial, recreational, monitoring, and rebuilding of the stock. Option one across all those four topics is basically no action. And this is no action as though the emergency rule were not in place. So option one, commercial, of course, is keeping the current regulations. Option two is require live release of shortfin makos in the pelagic longline fishery. Options three and four are what in, are in place now as a result of the emergency rule. Option five is to remove um, shortfin mako from the pelagic shark quota and create its own quota. Keep in mind, ICAT has not established a quota for shortfin mako sharks. Option six and option seven are themes of the same type. The first one would allow non-pelagic longline commercial fishermen to land shortfin mako if it's greater than 83 inches. Option seven would be the same, but if there was an observer on board. And then option eight is prohibit landings of shortfin mako sharks live or dead. Moving on to the recreational options. Again, we have the no action. Then we have option two, which would prohibit landing of shortfin mako sharks, but we'd still allow catch and release. So this is similar to what we allow for white sharks, where you could target shortfin mako, you would then just have to release it. Option three would be implementing the ICAT recommendation with the male and the female size limits. Option four is what's in the emergency rule. Option five would be to keep that larger size limit, but allow landings only in registered tournaments. Option six would be establish a tagging lottery program along with the minimum size. So there you could only land the short fin mako if you actually had some sort of tag or lottery chip indicating that you've won the lottery and you can land one. Option seven would be to require the use of circle hooks throughout the fishery. So if you remember in Amendment 5B, we implemented circle hooks for any time, any place south of Chatham, Massachusetts, and that was a result of the range of dusky sharks. In option seven, we would require circle hooks even north of Chatham, and that's because shortfin makos can be found in that area. Option eight would be to establish a minimum size that's greater than 83 inches. This could be as much as, say, 108 inches, and 108 inches is the size of maturity, the 50% size of maturity for shortfin makos. And then option nine would be a variable in-season minimum size. So this, the minimum size could change as you move up and down the coast, depending upon the, the season. Moving into monitoring, and I'm almost done here, there's just a few here, and that would be establish mandatory reporting of shortfin makos on vessel monitoring systems. We already require this for pelagic longline fishermen for bluefin tuna. We would just also require it now for shortfin mako. Option three would be to implement mandatory reporting of shark landings and discards in registered tournaments. That would be through our ATR system, which many of you are already familiar with when you report your swordfish, billfish. Option four would be to implement mandatory reporting of recreationally landed and discarded shortfin mako sharks across the entire recreational fishery. So that could be through an app, maybe the website, vessel trip reports. And then we looked at rebuilding plan options. One would be to do nothing. Another could be to work unilaterally without ICAT, keeping in mind the U.S. is only responsible for about 11% of all the harvest. And then option three would be to work with ICAT to come up with a rebuilding plan. So that's all the options we're looking at, but this is a scoping phase, so we are open to more options. All comments on both the emergency rule and 
the Amendment 11 scoping documents are, are due May 7th. I believe that's next Monday. All the information on how to submit the comments is on that, this slide. Guy is with me in the back. Toby is up in, in Gloucester, so he's a little bit far to come down here. Um, but you can reach out to any of us if you have additional questions. So as I said, comment period ends on May 7th. Um, we hope to have Amendment 11 out as a proposed rule this coming summer, possibly by the end of July. In August, the emergency rule expires with a possible extension for 186 days, which brings it up to March. And by next March is when we do hope to have a final rule out for Amendment 11. A little game changer in all of this, as I said before, ICAD is meeting in November. They could change what the recommendation is at that time. And that's it. Thank you, Carol. Are there any questions from members of the board? David Pierce. Yeah, thank you, Carol. <clears throat> uh, you noted in your presentation, and it's certainly covered in the Federal Register announcement for the emergency rule that um, it's expected that the uh, landings, commercial landings, will drop by about 75% with this rule, and recreational landings of the short fair makos will drop by about 83%, and then some numbers are provided regarding expected economic impact. Uh, also in your presentation, you highlighted that um, Spain and Morocco, as well as a few other nations, take the vast majority of, uh, of the short fair mako. And then, indeed, this is a recommendation that really is not a recommendation. It's something that the U.S. must do. So my question is, what are the other countries going to do? It would seem that if they don't take important and necessary steps, that what you're proposing um, will have hardly any effect on the status of the stock dealing with overfishing and an overfished stock. So what are, the, what are the other nations going to do? The Federal Register announcement, I don't think, makes any mention of that, which is important to know because it puts it all in proper context. So what's, what's happening with our, with our friends to the, the East? So the ICAT recommendation um, is a requirement for all the different countries. So as I said, there were a number of derogations or possibilities for people to choose from or for countries to choose from. So all these other countries have to do something that is in the recommendation. I do not know off the top of my head. I don't know if other nations have acted at this point. But everybody is required to do something, and everybody knows that the first six months of this year are going to be looked at to see if it was enough. And if it's not enough, ICAT could take additional steps in November. So everyone is, all the nations are required. You're not sure yet what the other nations will do, notably Morocco uh, and Spain. Uh, do we have any track record regarding Morocco and Spain on short fin Mako? to see if indeed they have done what they're supposed to do, or is this sort of a new situation they're faced with for a short fin mako? So I think for short fin mako, this is a new situation for all of us, not just for Spain and Morocco. I will say that ICAT has a compliance committee, and they do make sure that uh, different countries are in compliance. In the past, when countries have not been in compliance, there have been trade restrictions placed on those countries. Any other questions or comments? I see a hand in the back. Jim Estes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank Jack. you, Carol, for your presentation. So I noticed that when you were going over the results of the previous stock assessments, it looked like the status has really jumped around. And so my question really goes to the, our your confidence in the status based on this assessment. So I know we don't have a lot of data for these things, um, and we're using different models. And so how confident are we that the status is as we found in the assessment? I think for short fin mako, we're fairly confident. It is a pretty important species, um, not just for the U.S., but for other countries, because it is one of the species that tastes really good. Um, so. While for many species we don't have strong data, I think for short fin mako we have pretty strong data, and it's just getting stronger as, as more and more data come in. Jay? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, really interesting stuff. And I think I'll start with a quick comment. Um, and I think it speaks uh, a little bit to what Mr. Estes just asked about. And so this was an amazing piece of work. I really enjoyed reading it with all of the different modeling approaches. There's a Bayesian approach and a, a data limited approach and then the statistical catch at age. Um, we, we did a very similar thing for Tatog a, a couple of years ago, tried, you know, all these different models and the coherence between um, the models was, you know, I think notable for me. They were coherent with stock status, uh, at least for the North Atlantic stock uh, or the Northern stock rather. <clears throat> so that gives me some confidence that we're looking at a, a not good situation for Shorf and Mako. The, just one question with regard to uncertainty, and I, I think perhaps the answer might be we're such a small, this is a small component of a small component, so it doesn't matter, but I was thinking about some of the um, other fisheries that we at ASMFC deal with and the fact that MRIP, which is where the recreational data, at least in part, is coming from, uh, is about to be recalibrated. And so I was wondering if that was a, a topic of discussion during the assessment, if they tested any, um, did any runs where they jumped out. I didn't see that in there, but I wondered if they uh, boosted the numbers up for MAKOs at all, just to see what the impact um, of those recalibrated numbers might be on the outcomes. So for short fin MAKO, the recreational numbers generally come from the large pelagic survey and not from MRIP. Um, I do not believe the LPS numbers are going to be modified as much as MRIP right now, though we are in the process of looking how to update LPS. And as far as whether the assessment scientists looked at upping our recreational numbers or decreasing it as a result, I don't think they would have because, as you pointed out, the U.S. is a very small component of the overall whole. Were there any other questions or comments at this time? Uh, seeing none, I think I'll call on Kirby for um, a report of the technical committee. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, today we have a number of species of shark that we're going to be presenting on. Um, I've structured my PowerPoint to try to go through each of those uh, sequentially. So first, I'm going to just uh, provide what the technical committee uh, was tasked with in their uh, subsequent response to that task. Um, after that, I'll take any questions you might have on Chorf and Mako. Uh, keep in mind for this agenda item, um, if the board would like to provide comment regarding Amendment 11, uh, as this is the scoping period, uh, we can take that. Um, and then after that, we can discuss further if the board wishes to take management action um, on Shorf and Mako. Uh, but so the technical committee uh, was tasked by the board chair uh, a number of items in light of the Shorf and Mako assessment. Um, the TC met back in March of 2018 to discuss those tasks. Um, for short for MAKO, uh, the first task was to review the stock assessment and consider providing the board any recommendations on potential management actions that the states could take to backstop the federal measures. And the second was to review the emergency rule management measures implemented for short fin mako sharks and provide the board the per potential conservation benefits of adopting complementary management measures in state waters for state permit holders. So in considering uh, short fin mako, the short fin mako fishery, um, most of the Atlantic short fin mako uh, commercial landings come from federal waters. Uh, there's minimal contribution from state waters on the commercial side. Uh, part of this is due to the species preference for open ocean pelagic habitat. Um, Carol uh, provided uh, me as well as the technical committee with some information on recreational harvest uh, through both MRIP and uh, the uh, LPS data set and less than 1% of uh, harvest uh, that has occurred um, comes from state waters during the period of 2010 to 2016. So given the minimal landings, um, implementing emergency measures in state waters, the technical committee felt would likely not have a significant impact. Um, there were concerns raised by the TC 
uh, regarding having inconsistent regulations between state and federal waters for recreational anglers and for hire vessels. Um, but overall, the, the TC uh, came away with two main points, which is a preference to provide comments on uh, the Amendment 11 through scoping currently, as uh, there is, as Carol indicated, that the likelihood that these measures could change, um, and that the other component was rather than um, having a specific board action where all states implement, um, that the TC recommended states implement the emergency rule measures if possible for consistency purposes. So with that, I'll take any questions specific to the short fin MAKO task uh, that the TC was given. No comments or questions? Kirby, do you want to move on to the um, issue of Amendment 11? Yeah, we can do that. Sonia does have her hand raised in the back. Okay. There is a hand in the audience. Sonia, would you come up to the mic and identify yourself, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Sonia Fordham, Shark Advocates International. I, I'm sorry, I had raised my hand about um, Carol's presentation. Is it appropriate to just make some comments on MAKOs? Okay, thank you. Um, it, just in response to uh, uh, Dr. Pierce's question to start, because I, I do serve on the U.S. Um, advisory panel for ICAT, uh, I would agree that uh, the need for other countries, particularly Spain, to implement limits on mako sharks in particular is really important and urgent. Um, but I think also with regard to, you know, their track record, I would argue that um, Spain has actually implemented ICAT measures for hammerheads and shark finning more fully and uh, rigorously than the U.S. Um, I attended as an observer the ICAT meeting uh, for this stock assessment for MAKOs, um, and I appreciate Carol's presentation and the mention of the, the um, severity of the situation and the need to essentially get catches to zero to recover in a couple decades. I just want to add that, uh, or add or underscore that the scientists were exceptionally clear in their recommendation. Uh, that the recommendation for a full prohibition on retention has been done for a lot of other sharks, uh, in addition to other measures to reduce incidental mortality. We've had a lot of talk about shore fin makers in this assessment at the federal level, at the ICAT and HMS meetings. Uh, one dominant theme that I've heard from fishermen is that the news is as a shock and sort of out of the blue, and I just want to uh, to stress that the scientists, uh, the ICAT scientists have signaled trouble for short fin makos as far back as 2004, and a, about a decade ago ranked them uh, near the top of the list in terms of vulnerability to ICAT fisheries as part of an ecological risk assessment that was peer reviewed. Um, so although the status is quite sobering, I don't really think it should be a big surprise given the warnings that we've had so far and the inherent uh, the, the reproductive characteristics of this particular animal. We appreciate NOAA's work at ICAT to, as uh, Carol mentioned, get a meaningful agreement that aims to stem declines and has follow-up actions to feed into recovery plan. Um, and we congratulate the agency for the speed at which these regulations are being promulgated. Uh, that said, um, the U.S. action is needed, uh, again, to Dr. Pierce's point. The U.S. action is essential to the international NGOs that are working very hard to get similar action that's needed from other countries, particularly the ones he mentioned, Spain and Morocco. So it does appear that this is a, the emergency regs and hopefully Amendment 11 will lead to substantial reductions in fishing mortality for MAKOs, but the fact remains that the ICAT scientists, thanks to improved data and modeling, as has been mentioned, uh, have been exceptionally clear in their findings and recommendations for what needs to be done. And because of that, my organization and uh, many 
other conservation NGOs continue to support a MAKO prohibition along with those additional actions to minimize mortality as rec recommended by scientists. We understand, of course, that MAKO sharks are uh, economically more valuable than most, if not all, other shark species, and yet we also note there are similar prohibitions that have been implemented for 20 or so species along the Atlantic coast, often based on much less information that we have in this assessment. Um, short fin makers are indeed an emergency situation in the interest of preventing complete collapse and restoring a population that is important to the full range of your stakeholders. Uh, we urge states to heed the scientific advice and prohibit all retention uh, as a means to produce the incentive to capture them in the first place. And finally, I'll just mention that we had a lot of conversation at the HMS meeting from other uh, panel members that the size limit was towards the low end of the range of what has been described in the literature for the species. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sonia. Any other questions or comments? Adam Nowalski. With a lot of the species we deal with in other boards, uh, vessels that are permitted through GARFO have a requirement of adhering to the most restrictive measure when state measures are different. Do HMS permits, recreational people need to get a HMS permit for these species? Does that have the same type of enforcement aspect as well, so that if states don't implement complementary measures for whatever reason and a fisherman gets back to the dock, would they be subject to HMS enforcement of the most restrictive measure? Um, fortunately, we have um some folks that can address that issue. Thank you for bringing it up, Adam. Uh, we have Greg Garner, and of course, Carol is our resident expert on such matters. So um, I'm going to call on Carol, but uh, Greg is here. Uh, Greg Garner is here representing the Law Enforcement Committee. If uh, if he needs to add anything to what Carol says, Carol. Thanks. So yes, if they have an HMS permit. As a condition of that permit, they are required to follow HMS federal regulations, even in state waters, unless the state has more restrictive regulations. Any follow-up or additional comments? Greg, do you have anything to add to that? No. Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to clarify, in my own mind, the HMS permit. So for tunas, if I understand it correctly, for tunas, you must have an HMS permit regardless of where you're fishing. That's part one. Is that correct? But for sharks, you only need an, you, you don't need an HMS permit if you never go outside of the state waters. Is that correct? Carol. Yes, for tunas, we manage the species all the way to the shore. So if you are fishing in state waters for tuna, you still need an HMS permit. If you are fishing in state waters for sharks, you do not need a HMS permit. Any further comments or questions in that regard? All right, why don't we move on to um, the second part of this agenda item, discuss possible board comment to HMS on Amendment 11. And again, I'll call on Kirby. Um, thank you, Mr. Board Chair. So as uh, Carol presented earlier, we have a number of items in Amendment 11. If this board wishes to provide comment at this time on them, uh, we can get those back up on the screen in terms of each of those options that have been laid out by the different uh, issue uh, issue items. If you go back to Carol's presentation. Oh. 
So are there any uh, comments that this board wishes to make on the options currently in Amendment 11? Keep in mind this is the scoping document. You proceed, Kirby. Um, well, if, if there aren't any uh, comments on the commercial options, we can move on to the other ones. But if, if there are no uh, comments that the board feels like they're ready to provide at this point on any of those uh, issue items in the amendment, uh, we can move on to discussing potential management responses to the emergency rule measures. Okay, so, um, oh, okay. yes, Mike. Thanks, Kirby. <clears throat> Excuse me, I just have a quick question about the timeline. Could you go back and, and discuss um, what we might be looking at regarding the review that ICAT's going to do in November and how that review may affect Amendment 11 going forward? Is there, is there some, depending on that review, is it, would there could could there be changes to the options in Amendment 11, and how would that timeline would it have to start all over again, or would you would, would you be able to make changes uh, on the fly? Carol, can you answer that? That is the uh, the big question. Um, so we are trying to have a large enough range in our various options that we wouldn't necessarily have to start over again with Amendment 11. <laughs> Um, but obviously ICAT could decide something that we didn't think about and that could scrap everything in Amendment 11. Follow up, Mike. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So with the idea that the states would consider um, implementing the emergency measures at this time, there is the possibility a half a year from now or after November that those rules would could change and the states would have to go through another process in order to correct for whatever actions ICAT takes or whatever recommendations they make based on that review. Is that right? That's our understanding. Comments or questions additional? Anyone? Uh, Kirby, I'm going to call on you again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, before the board today, uh, if this board wishes to take action in response to the emergency rule measures that have been implemented um, in federal waters for uh, HMS permit holders um, and complement that in state waters, there are a few uh, possibilities moving forward. The first is this board could, could move to take no action today. Um, the second, if, if the board so wishes states could individually move forward with trying to implement these measures on a state-by-state -state basis. Through the Commission's process, um, what the board could do today is implement the measures under emergency action. Uh, what this would require is a public comment period and public hearings following uh, this meeting. Um, the other option would be to initiate an addendum to the fishery management plan. Uh, currently, the FMP does not allow for uh, the board to modify uh, these management measures on an annual basis, um, so an addendum would be needed to uh, to address that. Um, just so that it's clear on what emergency action is, if the board wish to complement those federal measures in state waters through emergency action, it's laid out in the uh, Interstate Fishery Management uh, Program Charter in Section 6, uh, the definition 
provision applies if circumstances affect either public health, conservation of the coastal fishery resource, uh, or the attainment of FMP objectives that have been placed at risk by unanticipated changes in the ecosystem, the stock, or the fishery. Um, the board can require emergency action for items not covered under the FMP, and it's treated effectively as an amendment. Um, it requires a two-thirds majority vote uh, to pass, and within 30 days of that action, at least four public hearings must be held. And similar to what uh, Carol laid out for the HMS uh, emergency uh, rule measures, it would be in place for 180 days and could be extended up to 180 days. So with that, I'll take any questions at this point. Some of you may be like me and, and not be terribly familiar with the, the Commission's emergency process. We have used emergency rulemaking in the past. Uh, some of you may recall that we used it with regard to northern shrimp, well, also was used for lobster. So there is precedent for the Commission adopting regulations through the emergency procedure process. I did see a hand go up. Tom Fody, was that you? If you're still on questions, I'll wait till after you finish with questions. Any, any question, uh, Adam Nowalski? If I heard correctly, we can't change any of these measures through board action. It would require an addendum. Mike alluded to the fact that these may change again. If we're going through an addendum process, can we make the measures to give us the ability to change them through board action, through addendum, or would that require an amendment? I'm just looking ahead here, and if we might need multiple actions, and if we're going to do a management document anyway, maybe what the goal we should be looking at is giving ourselves that flexibility to be more flexible with changing these measures. I'm going to look for direction from staff, perhaps Bob, on that particular question, or Tony. Adam, that would require an addendum to give you that flexibility to take board action to make that change as well. So I just put that out there for consideration that if we're looking at doing an addendum anyway, possibly for change in measures, maybe we would give ourselves that flexibility as part of that addendum. It's a good suggestion, Adam. Tom Foti had a comment? Yeah, that's where I was going. I'm, you know, at really the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission is de minimis status when it comes to basically our landings is we're less than one percent so we can't do an addendum to reflect that but we should do an addendum uh i'm not sure what we should do in the short term because you know i don't know what the how, how long would that take us 180 days will we be close to november by the time we got this done so if we started one now we could get completed maybe by August and have it ready to implement at the annual meeting, which is October, so we know what to go, what's going on. But that would be my sense to do a direction here, do an addendum. Tom Foti has suggested we go down the addendum path. Um, Tony, you have your hand up. I just would note that 180 days would get you to November 1st. You can extend emergency actions for another 180 days if needed. Um, if the measures have the possibility of changing at that November ICAP meeting, then emergency action would get you almost to that and then extended through it. And then you could do, if you wanted to do an addendum in response, you could either do it during that first 180 days or in the second 180 days. But I think you would want to do that addendum once you knew for sure what those measures would be, because otherwise you would just have to turn around and do another addendum if the, if the measures changed at that November um, ICAP meeting. Tom? When we made the addendum as flexible, saying that if the, if the changes occur, that we implement those changes. Because what we're going to do is implement what the, what the feds do, because it's mostly is covered by HMS. And I can't remember the last time a show up in Mako was caught in state waters, I think 15 to 20 years ago. I remember a friend landing, and plus he released it. It was like eight, you know, small, too small to keep anyway. So I'm not sure, you know, 
we could do both at the same time, but I'm just looking at if it's going to change periodically over the things, we're going to need an addendum any time, every time it comes out. Maybe we put something that's flexible just to follow the federal rules on this, because that's what we're going to implement, because most of the covers, everybody I know, the Fisher and Makos, has, you know, a high HMS permit. Maybe other states are different. That's what I'm looking at is what we do in New Jersey. Other suggestions? Mike Luisi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I think, well, federal waters are currently managed, and I believe it's important that we follow up those federal waters measures with state, with complementary state waters measures, just to close the loop and be consistent. I just think that given some of the uncertainty that's going to take place over the next six months with the ICAT review of those rules and what other countries are doing and the possibility that um, ICAT may recommend something different, I, I just I don't think it I don't think it hurts us to just delay delay an addendum until after everything is clear as to what would be part of the uh, Amendment 11 process and you know. Makos aren't they're, they're not um, they're not occurring in, in state water. So I think we as far, because federal waters are already managed. I think we've we're addressing the concern. But personally, as for my state, I'd prefer to hold off at this time before we go through a, a full regulatory process to in, uh, incorporate new rules that that could change in six months. Thanks. Stu Mickles. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with Mike more. Um, I, I certainly see the need for consistency, uh, but in this case, I think it's more prudent to wait. I mean, it's very costly for the states to adopt these regulations, and uh, I don't think we'll have an appreciable impact on the population given the timing of this, and I think it's prudent for us to, to just hold off and find out what goes on in November. Thank you, Stu. Jim Estes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just going to agree with Mr. Luisi also. Tom Foti. That means, uh, okay, we, if we're not doing, are we going to do emergency action to put, implement these in the state, water, the state rules? Because that's going to be the same thing, costly process as we go through. Because I thought that's what you said, Mike. Maybe I misunderstood. Follow up, Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, Tom. So what, I, what I'm suggesting is that we we don't do the emergency action plan that was reviewed by Kirby and that we hold off until ICAT takes a look at landings over the last six or the first six months of this year. If anything, if anything comes from ICAT that's different from what's already been recommended, uh, NOAA is going to need to make changes to Amendment 11. But if no, if no new recommendations come, then we have the Am Amendment 11 document that will move forward and we could begin an, an addendum to incorporate those management actions at, in, at the state level sometime this time next year. Adam? So I agree with being opposed to emergency action for changing measures. I agree with not changing state measures this year through an addendum, but would we gain some flexibility moving forward if we did an addendum, initiated one here today, to give us the flexibility to change the measures through board action? So that's done this year. And then when we get to November or this time next year, we could just change the measures to board action without needing to go through an addendum process. Then we'd be setting ourselves up for that. Is there interest around the table in pursuing that now so we're ready for that? I, I think ultimately we all agree we want to see complementary state waters measures. I think we all agree we're going to have to do it at some point the question just becomes when we don't want to do it twice, but this could potentially set us up to be ready and more nimble for it. I'm going to circle back to Adam's question, which is a reasonable one. I'll call on Jay McNamee for the moment. Yeah, and I think so um, struggling a little bit, maybe I'll, I'll start with a comment to say I, I would be more inclined. Um, stock status is poor. Uh, and the rebuilding, there was no, they couldn't rebuild by 
2040 or uh, it's a long trajectory so I would while I I agree with what folks are saying it's inconvenient um, a little messy because of the timing of things I, I really would like to act sooner rather than later um, I think we always have the flexibility as a state to move forward regardless and Rhode Island might avail itself of that anyways regardless of what happens here but um, you know I think if I'm struggling a little bit to understand the timing so maybe I'll, I'll try and restate what Adam just offered to see if I have it in my head right so it's the idea to initiate an addendum but delay it to the effect of getting some overlap with that November ICAT meeting so we um, so we don't have to repeat multiple processes that's what I'm trying to figure out because I I could get behind that I, I don't want to put words in Adam's mouth but my impression Jay was that what Adam was suggesting was um, that we we consider starting the addendum process now but build some wording flexibility into that addendum that we could change uh, our management direction in response to the ICAT deliberations in November. Did I get that approximately right, Adam? Go ahead. The purpose of the addendum that we would initiate today would not be to change the measures this year. The purpose of the addendum would be to give the board flexibility to change the measures through board action without not going through another addendum process next year. That would be the purpose of the addendum that we would do this year. If I could follow up, Adam, then what you're suggesting is the addendum would not contain the 83-inch size limit, the, the specific measures that ICAT is requiring at this point in time. It would just give us uh, the authority to, to uh, change by uh, administrative action when the time came. That's exactly correct. I think that would be something from a public perspective that would not create contentious public hearings at that point. I think that's something that could probably be done with a minimal amount of overhead. On the other hand, to get back to um, Dr. McNamee's suggestion, um, he sees urgency in the present situation, I take it, Jay. and. You, you were perhaps leaning towards the emergency process. Is, is that a fair statement? Um, yeah, I, I would uh, prefer taking more rapid action in, in the short term. Um, I like the efficiency of what Adam is as that kind of subsequent step, so I would still support that, but I would like to see action taken by the states in the shorter term as well. Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had a question for Mr. Nowalski, if that's okay. So, Adam, you're, you're suggesting a, you know, a structural addendum that allow the board to take, to, through board action, change regulations. But that would be that would be an ongoing authority that the board have. It would not be just for this one instance uh, to react to ICAT. It would be moving forward as as you know HMS change their regulations. The board would could consider what HMS has. The changes they've made and, and take board action to make changes in the future, right? So you're not you're not suggesting a one-off to be able to react to ICAT this go around. It, it's a ongoing flexibility that you're looking for. Is that right? I'm in fact suggesting exactly that we would not be required to go through the process every year, nor would it be one-off. But then we'd have the tool in the toolbox when the board needed to use it. Cole and Dr. Pearson and uh, Tom Foti. Yeah, my preference is to uh, <clears throat> take the advice that was provided by at least some technical committee members at their last meeting where it says on the second page, I think it is, second page of the summary of their meeting that um, 
you know, they would recommend states individually implement the emergency measures, if possible, to have more consistency in measures between state and federal waters. I'm certainly willing to take a close look at this. We always have on any issue that relates to the conservation issues specific for uh, any, any species of shark. Uh, I'm willing to look at this, bring it back to my own state Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission to discuss what we should do on some basis, perhaps on an emergency basis, and if not an emergency basis, and certainly the move forward to be uh, you know, supportive of whatever comes out of uh, the next discussions uh, by, by ICAP relative to the short fin makeup. You know, I don't support moving forward with an addendum right now. I certainly don't support emergency action by, by ASMFC. I think it should be an individual state initiative, which I'm willing to do, of course. Other states I'm not, I'm not sure of. Um, um, again, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what the, what the real consequence is of states not implementing specific restrictions for states' waters uh, fishing that may occur for, for short fin mako. I, I, don't, I don't believe it's a big issue, if it's an issue at all. However, I'd, I'd like to talk to my law enforcement division to get their perspective. Maybe the law enforcement committee of ASMFC should weigh in on this if they haven't already. So that's my preference. Just leave it up to the individual states to, to take action. And as I just indicated, I'm, I'm certainly willing to look into this with the possibility that if not emergency action, then some action taken through a normal regulatory process uh, might, might very well be warranted. Tom. You were next. I'll just pass. I was, I was going to say I agree with Adam. That's what I was trying to get across in the beginning was to basically start something just that we wouldn't implement to maybe February because we don't have a November meeting. We're meeting in October, so if we don't do anything. It'll be February before we can do anything. And that'd be the time we would know the ICAT regulations be in place to do something. We had to do it at that point. That's what I was thinking in the first place. But, you know, whatever the board wants to do. Well, we've had some, um, some suggestions. What's the board's pleasure in this regard? I'm not, I'm not feeling a consensus at this point in time. Uh, additional opinions? Adam? Well, I'll try to provide a lightning rod in the form of a motion to get specific opinions. I would move to initiate an addendum to give this board flexibility to modify measures through board action. Would that need to be specific to this species or could it apply to multiple species? Just for species. Tony? Adam, it's the will of the board. So I, if you only want it to be certain species, I would specify the species that you are looking to react to. Um, and if you want it to be all species within the plan, then you can say all species within the FMP. Well, I'll start with all species to, again, to put something up there as a lightning rod to move this forward. Tony. And Adam, would this be um, specific to react to federal measures, or do you want it for it to be for any type of issue that comes before the board? I would leave it at board discretion right now. I. Um, let me read that since it just went up. Move to initiate an addendum to give the board the flexibility to implement measures for all species within the Coastal Shark FMP through board action. Is that the gist of what you intended, Adam? That's correct. Thank you. Is there a second to that motion? Jim Astis? Discussion on the motion. Any, any comments? Colleen? I would support this motion because it, I like the open, transparent process of the public hearing. 
um, and the opportunity for the public to comment. Some of our recreational anglers who do shark fish have made um, made their feelings clear the frustration with the increases in the minimum size because they're really not aware of the current status of the mako population. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, in the back, Doug. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little concerned about uh, the uh, all of the coastal sharks that are included in this fishery management plan. Um, I mean, we were specifically talking about the Mako. I'm just wondering uh, if all the states. I think I guess this would regulate all those shark species uh, to mirror the the federal regulations in their state waters. Is that correct? Is that where we're going? It's pretty much how I read it. Adam, do you have a different interpretation? This would not require we change any regulations at the present time, but this would give us the flexibility that when we want to, either through complementary HMS action or need to for some other reason, we'd have the ability to do so without going through a lengthy management document process. But it wouldn't require any change at the present time, wouldn't require us to be beholden to HMS or anything else specifically, just gives us the flexibility to change them without a lengthy management document. I uh, saw so a couple hands go up. Uh, Robert first, then Chris, then uh, Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let the record reflect. It looks like the rest of the commission is catching up with South Carolina <laughs> because uh, we already adopt by, by reference um, federal regulations with respect to sharks. I, I think, based on Adam's comment, that this is really a process addendum. And, Mr. Chairman, it would help me to know how to vote here. I, I thought this was the whole purpose of going through the Coastal Sharks Plan the way we did prior. So is this, is this simply a method to, um, to make it even easier for the Commission to adopt complementary plans, should we desire, without going through an FMP amendment or addendum? That's my impression. Adam is Adam is shaking his head. Yes. I had was it Chris next? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, j just so I uh, understand uh, the the motion uh, entirely, th this still gives the board the option of adopting certain federal measures, but not other federal measures like we've done in the past. It's my impression. Adam again is nodding yes. Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have two questions. Um, one was partially asked by Mr. Boyles. Um, so, don't we already have the flexibility to implement measures? So, Adam, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think what, what you're suggesting is that just by board action, we could we could um, implement measures. Right? But we already don't we already have. Doesn't the board already have the flexibility to implement measures for all species within the shark FMP? It's just a matter of how we go about doing it. Um, that's the first question. And the second question is, do we have anything similar with any other fishery management plan? Kirby, you want to tackle that one? Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, board, um, Mr. Chair. So in reviewing the FMP and trying to make sense of whether uh, board action could uh, be made to ad adjust measures to be complementary to federal ones, it, we found that you would need an addendum in order to match that. Uh, we don't have that flexibility for board action to change size limits, possession limits. Um, uh, so an addendum is required every time the board wishes to make uh, to take action to, to complement federal measures. Tony? 
Just to answer the second part of your question, Emerson, this the Sharks plan actually allows the board to do certain things through specification setting every year. So for the large coastal projects, I think it is the um, possession limit we can change through board action. Just like in Summer Flounder, we set the quota every year through a board action. So it's similar to specification setting and, you know, the shark plan has a lot of different types of management um, that we utilize to um, look at the fishery, like possession limits, seasonal allocations, um, set asides, all sorts of different methodologies. So I think you're covered under the, the FMP for all the different types of ways you would manage, and then you would just do it through board action if this board were to, if this motion were to pass and the addendum were to pass. Did that answer the question for everyone? Emerson? Yes, thank you very much. All right, so. If there are no further comments on the motion, I, I have one, Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so I'll ask that you be uh, patient with me because I've not done anything like this yet and so what i'd like to do is offer an amendment something to add on to onto this motion you ready okay so i move that in the interim the asmfc initiate an emergency action to adopt regulations consistent with the federal rules for short from mako in state waters Does that look like it captures your thoughts, Jay? Yep, I apologize if it's clumsy, uh, but yeah. Let me read it for those who, who can't see it from the back. Move to am amend to add that in the interim, the ASMFC implement an emergency action to implement regulations consistent with HMS for short fin makos in state waters. Um, motion by Dr. McNamee, is there a second to that motion? <laughs> Tom, I'll take a question. Yeah, um, the emergency action requires a two-thirds vote to move to the addendum. It should be two separate motions since one requires a two-thirds, one requires a majority vote. Is there a second for this amendment? Emerson? Or, um, Point of order. Go ahead, Robert. Point of order. I, Mr. Chairman, I, I believe Mr. Foti is correct. And so the question is how do we move this forward with this amendment with two separate thresholds in order to pass the motion? So I, I, I just would call for point of order. Bob, help us out. Uh, procedurally, I think if the board wants to combine these two different ideas, an addendum and an emergency rule, or emergency action, sorry. Um, they can do that, and then that would make both of these, or, or that combined two-part motion would be subject to the two-thirds um, requirement. If the board wants to keep them separate, I think you vote the amendment down with the notion that, you know, you can initiate an addendum and there may be a subsequent motion to initiate an emergency action that the board could consider. So if you combine these two ideas, Though the, the joint motion now requires the two-thirds vote for both both pieces of that joint motion. If the board wants to keep them separate, you can vote the amendment down, and you know then you're back to the main motion on the addendum, and then a subsequent uh, motion could come along for an emergency action. If that's helpful. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? 
Dr. Pierce. Well, uh, the amendment really does put us in an entirely different uh, direction, set us in an entirely different direction because I thought we were moving away from emergency action for very good reasons and that we would uh, go the addendum route that uh, likely would end up with our adopting rules very similar to or equal to what has been uh, uh, adopted by the service uh, on, on an emergency basis. And, and then down the road we see what happens uh, at ICAT and then we respond accordingly that would be reflected in an addendum that we would uh, we would adopt so I can't support the this uh, this motion I can't support the motion to uh, to amend because it does that which I don't support I do support the first part but not the second part especially since I don't see how why ASMFC would now if this was to pass force the states to take emergency action to do what? To adopt the short fin, MAKO, emergency regulations established by the National Marine Fisheries Service? That's a hard sell in my state, especially because I can't, I can't claim it's an emergency. Not in my state, but I can certainly move forward to, uh, to deal in a very responsible manner with what the service has proposed. And once again, what will come out of further discussions on how best to deal with the uh, you know, the conservation requirements of, uh, of the short fin MAKO. So I'll, I'll oppose the motion to amend, but I'll, I'll certainly support the, uh, the original motion. Is there anyone who wishes to speak in favor of the amendment that has not already done so? Um, before we vote, I just wanted to have Kirby remind us of what the technical committee had for us in regard to uh, the need for emergency action. Kirby, can you help remind us? Uh, sure. So uh, again, um, when the technical committee met uh, back in March, the, their recommendation was that states implement uh, the emergency uh, measures if possible for consistency purposes, um, uh, but did not uh, specify that the board should, uh, through emergency action, implement those measures. So they were offering it up as a, on a state-by-state -state basis. Are there any further comments concerning the uh, amendment? And seeing none, we should probably take a vote on the amendment. Um, according to Executive Director Beal, this would require a two-thirds vote for approval, this particular amendment. So. Um, all states in favor of the amendment, would you raise your right hand, please? Two. Those opposed, raise your right hand. Uh, any abstentions? Any null votes? All right, the, the motion fails, two to, 11. 2 to 11. All right, so we're back to the main motion. And we should probably read that again. Um, move to initiate an addendum to give the board the flexibility to implement measures for all species within the Coastal Shark FMP through board action. A uh, motion by Mr. Nowalski, second by Mr. Estes. Any further discussion of the main motion? Seeing none, are you ready to vote on the main motion? I, I should have allowed time for a, uh, a, a caucus. I'm sorry, I forgot to do that on the amendment. I'll, I'll allow um, 15 seconds or so for 30 seconds for caucus on this particular vote. Go ahead. I should ask if there's any public comment before we take a vote on this motion. Well, seeing none. Are, are you ready to vote? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. Two, 
Those opposed? Any abstentions? Any no votes? It passed unanimously 14 to 0. Thank you. All right, let's move on to the next agenda item. Thank you for that response on short fin mako. Um, we're going to review the CDR 54 sandbar shark stock assessment. We're going to switch species, and I'm going to call on Carol Brewster Geis again. Um, bring us up to speed on the CDR 54. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this presentation is much shorter. Um, this past February, we finished CDAR 54, which was a standard assessment for sandbar sharks. Uh, it replaces CDAR 21, which was the benchmark assessment for sandbar sharks. It added more years. It had the same um, scope from Gulf Mexico and the Atlantic. Instead of the state-spaced age structured production model, or SPASM, it used a uh, stock synthesis model and the scientists did an extensive replication analysis to ensure that uh, stock synthesis was appropriate. So this is the results of the stock synthesis. You can see the graph on the left. Um, in the early time period, the, the data did not fit well due, to, well, the model didn't fit well due to the lack of data, but by the time we entered the rich, data rich period, it had nearly the same fit. It uh, did show that there was a stock synthesis was a slightly more productive model um, with a slightly higher FMSY value, and overall the stock status remained the same going up through 2009 using stock synthesis. So the scientists decided that this model did successfully replicate the results from spasm. This is just a graph showing the various indices of abundance that they used in the, uh, the current assessment. As you can see, some of the indices go up, some of them go down, so it's pretty much a, a mix. With the new model and the new assessment, they did update longevity and maturity parameters. They added in length data. This was new for Sambar. We hadn't had ability to do that. They also added in by uh, male and female, and you can see those length compositions on the screen with the green bar being age maturity. So these are the main results. Um, I, the, the two graphs on the right, you have biomass or SSF stocks, spawning stock fecundity on the top graph, and then the bottom graph is the fishing mortality. The highlighted bars are the, the parameters we look at to determine whether or not a stock is overfished or overfishing is occurring. So we have the, the biomass over biomass MSY equal to 0 0.77 and fishing mortality over fisher mortality MSY being 0 0.58. We usually look at MSST. Um, to see whether or not something's overfished. So those, the appropriate numbers are highlighted there too. This is the COBE plot. Um, most of the, most of the model showed that 85% showed that it was overfished, but overfishing is not occurring. About 15% probability that it is a healthy stock with less than 1% showing that it's overfished with uh, overfishing occurring. We also asked the stock scientists to look at projections to see what the total allowable catch should be going out to the year 2070. That is our current rebuilding time period. So there's a 70% chance of rebuilding by the year 2070 if we were to increase the TAC to 246 metric tons hull weight. That would be a 12% increase from the current tack. And then if you use 50% instead of 70% probability, we could have a 55% increase in the tack. We have not finalized our determination about the stock assessment, nor have we 
decided what we are going to do as a result of the assessment. So that's really all I have to share today. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Any questions on the uh, Sandbar Shark assessment, updated assessment? Jay? Yeah, uh, thanks again. So a lot more uncertainty with regard to stock status um, with, with that one. Um, my question, it was actually one I had that I kept to myself during the short fin Mako discussion, but so in both of these situations, uh, using stock synthesis, and, and I have the general impression that there's a, a lot of tagging information on, on sharks in general. Um, and so it wasn't clear to me how that tagging data, they talk about it in the documents, but I was wondering, is that tagging information integrated? Stock synthesis can integrate tagging information directly, and so I was wondering if that was done, um, and if not, you know, the other um, aspect that tagging data can give you is some sense during the period that the sharks were tagged of natural mortality. And I, I know reading in the short fin Mako one, they just used some of the, the rules of thumb. I, I guess that's how I understood it. So I was wondering, with all of this tagging information, if it's being, being used um, in any significant way in the modeling that's being done. Carol? So yes, the, the tagging results and information are being used in the models um, several ways. One, as you said, there's the mortality estimates. So that came into play with the short fin Mako where they definitely use that. The other way they're, they're directly using it is in terms of, um, for instance, we use a lot of the, the Mexican catches for some of the shark species as a result of showing that the tagging goes down into Mexico. Um, so. And I believe they used it in other ways, but I am still learning about stock synthesis, so I can't tell you exactly the other ways that it's it's being used, but I do know it's it's in there. I'm still learning too, but thank you. Any other questions for Carol concerning the uh, Sandbar Shark CDAR 54? Uh, seeing none, I'm going to call on Kirby for the technical committee reaction to the uh, Sandbar Shark CDR 54. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so very briefly, uh, the TC was tasked uh, with reviewing the stock assessment and to consider providing the board any recommendations on potential management action. Uh, it, it was made clear on the call, again, that the, the sandbar shark fishery is a research take only. There's no commercial fishery for sandbars. Uh, NOAA HMS has not adjusted their management program in response to the assessment yet. And in, in turn, the TC uh, had no formal recommendations on changing uh, management measures, rather to just maintain status quo measures. So thank you. Any questions on that TC report or comments? Seeing none, um, well, now that it's safe to go back in the water, let's move on to another large shark species. Um, we'll have an update on the Endangered Species Act status of oceanic white tip. And uh, again, um, am I calling on Carol for this one? Or? No, Chelsea Young, she's coming up. Chelsea Young is making her way up here. Chelsea? Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Chelsea Young, and I am with NOAA Fisheries Office of Protected Resources at our headquarters office in Silver Spring. Uh, today I was asked to come give you an update on the listing of the oceanic white tip uh, as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. So in this presentation, I'll give you a little bit of background about the process that we undertake under the Endangered Species Act to get species listed, um, some of the information that went into our decision-making process, and some of the implications that will result from this listing. So just to provide a little bit of a refresher for those of you that um, don't work directly with the Endangered Species Act, um, it was passed in 1973 with the main purpose of providing a conservation program for threatened and endangered species and the ecosystems upon which those species depend. 
Uh, and so under the Act, we deal with a couple of different definitions, those being of endangered species and threatened species. Um, and this is directly from the statute. An endangered species is any species that is in danger of extinction throughout all or significant portion of its range. And a threatened species is any species that is likely to become an endangered species within the foreseeable future. So these definitions are actually very closely linked and the only real difference between them is the timing at which this endangerment is happening. So for an endangered species, it's definitely a present day condition. And for a threatened species, it's more of a future condition that we can foresee based on current day circumstances. So this slide is pretty technical. Uh, it just shows basically the stepwise process that gets triggered any time we receive a petition to list a species under the Endangered Species Act. And it's important to know that most of the time we do receive petitions to list species and that triggers a requirement for us to respond under the Act. And it also triggers a number of statutory requirements and deadlines. So this just shows you all of the different processes and steps that we have to go when we do receive a petition and we accept it. Um, one thing I like to emphasize on this slide is the opportunities for public to provide comment. And this is not a voting process. We are not looking for comments to say whether you think it should be listed or not. We are really looking for substantial scientific or commercial information that would help inform our decision making. So for the oceanic white tip listing process in particular, um, we received a petition to list the species from an organization called Defenders of Wildlife back in September of 2015. And they asked us to list the species either globally or as two distinct population segments, that being the Atlantic and Indo-Pacific. Um, but when we went to review the petition, we um, basically decided we were gonna go forward with a status review of the species globally. So that's something important to keep in mind here. Um, we were having to look at the species throughout its entire range. Um, we convened an extinction risk analysis team in July of 2016 that was comprised of six members across NOAA, including um, my office, Protected Resources, HMS, um, and four fishery biologists from the Northeast, Southeast, Southwest, and Pacific Islands Fishery Science Center. So we had representation from across the region in every region where this species occurs. Um, we had the status review report peer reviewed by five peer reviewers, all with expertise in shark management, biology, um, and specific knowledge of oceanic white tips. We proposed the species to be listed as threatened back in December of 2016. And the final rule was published in January of 2018 with an effective date of March 1st. So this listing is now in effect. So just a little bit of background about what went into this listing determination. Again, as I mentioned, um, this species is globally distributed, so we had to consider the species status across its entire range. It has a clear preference for open ocean waters. It is a pelagic species. Um, and even though it can occur from 30 degrees north to 30 degrees south, it does have a preference for those latitudes that straddle the equator. Um, it does have a depth distribution of the upper mixed layer between 100, or 1 and 152 meters. It does dive a lot deeper than that. Um, but it is considered a surface dwelling shark. They like to hang out uh, near the surface, which basically makes it more um, vulnerable to interactions with longline fisheries, persane fisheries, and things of that nature. Um, and they do have a temperature preference for warm water. So partially the reason why this species has so many interactions with fisheries wherever it occurs is because its horizontal and vertical distribution really overlaps where the most fishing effort often occurs. Um, the species has some life history parameters that also do not lend itself to being very resilient to very uh, intense harvest levels. Um, they are long lived up to approximately 20 years. I have a relatively late age of maturity, not as late as the shortfin mako, but um, six to seven years for the Southwest Atlantic and eight to nine years for females in the North Pacific. Uh, has a lengthy gestation of nine to 12 months and relatively low fecundity. Um, and the kicker here is that they have uh, pups every two years, it is thought. So this um, slide here basically shows the uh, trends that we've seen based on all of the literature that we could find on the species. Um, it hasn't had a stock assessment anywhere but the Western and Central Pacific. Um, but basically for historical and current trends, they all basically show a same pattern of significant decline. Um, but you will notice that for the Northwest Atlantic, we do show a likely stabilized population. Um, and that was based on um, a standardized observer data analysis for the pelagic longline fishery. Um, so basically, this, is, this was one of the most important factors that we considered in our decision making was the status and trends of the abundance of the species throughout its range. 
Um, threats to the species, obviously, uh, the main one is overutilization in commercial fisheries as a result of both bycatch and the fin trade. Um, as I mentioned, um, because of their distribution, they are caught in large numbers globally, both in longline and purseine fisheries, among others. And the large majority that are caught are juveniles, so the species is being caught in large numbers, um, mostly with individuals that haven't reproduced yet. Um, they have a variety of at-vessel mortality rates um, from 23% to 58% in long lines and likely greater than 85% in purseines. I will note that the 23% is actually from the Northwest Atlantic Pelagic Longline Fishery where we do have safe release guidelines um, and regulations in place to release the species, um, whereas the 58%, the higher end of the spectrum, comes from the Indian Ocean, where obviously they don't have uh, the similar strict regulations that we have in our fisheries. And then there's an unknown post-release mortality rate, so we don't know what happens to the species once they are released. Um, the fin trade was a very big factor in this listing decision. It is considered a preferred species in the Hong Kong fin market. Um, it can obtain up to 40, 85 dollars per kilogram. Um, it has been historically the main economic driver for retaining the species, although it currently is um, prohibited from retention in all of the tuna RFMOs. Um, and it compri comprises approximately 2% of the global fin trade, and that does sound like a small percentage, but it equates to several hundred thousand to up to 1.2 million individuals per year. We also looked at whether current regulations are adequate to protect the species from the threats that I just mentioned. Um, I won't go through all of these in detail, but as I mentioned, all of the major tuna um, RFMOs do have no retention measures for the species, which underscores its conservation status. Um, however, we found that there is highly variable implementation and enforcement of these measures, particularly out in the Western and Central Pacific and Indian Oceans, um, as well as the South Atlantic um, and major shark fishing countries like Brazil. Um, so we did determine that these retention bans, although they are, um, you know, the first step in protecting the species in, on the high seas, are partially effective. Um, it was listed under CITES in 2013, um, but we have seen data since then that shows that there, there have been several confiscated shipments that have gone to Hong Kong without the proper CITES paperwork or permits. Um, we've also seen several instances of illegal fishing and trafficking of fins um, from a number of different countries. So a lot of these regulations are in place, but the level of enforcement and implementation is highly variable and not likely going to prevent further declines of the species in those places. So considering all of that information, we did an extinction risk assessment. We considered a foreseeable future of approximately 30 years to take into consideration the life history of the species, as well as how far forward we could foresee the threats um, going from today. Um, we took into account the significant historical and ongoing abundance declines throughout the species range, plus its life history characteristics, and the ongoing threats of overutilization and largely inadequate regulations. And we determined that it had a moderate risk of extinction, which basically means it's not endangered now. Now, but given the current conditions going forward, it's likely on a trajectory to be endangered in the foreseeable future. Um, and so that prompted a threat listing under the Endangered Species Act. So what happens next? So this is probably the information that you're most interested in. Um, what automatically kicks in for threatened and endangered species are what are called Section 7 consultations. Um, these are required for any federal actions that may affect the species. Um, so these are already underway for our federal fisheries, such as the HMS Pelagic Longline Fishery and HMS All Other Gears. Um, these are to make sure that these activities don't jeopardize the existence of the species. Um, we are also required to designate critical habitat. Um, at the time of listing, we're supposed to do this, but we didn't have enough information about the species uh, habitat needs and requirements to be able to do this, so we did um, extend uh, our one-year extension. Um, any critical habitat designation would be open to public comp comment. It would be a t an entirely separate rulemaking process. Um, and then protective regulations, um, also known as a 4D rule, is something that we can do at our discretion if we find that there are other measures that are necessary and advisable for the conservation of the species. At this time, we are not developing a 4D rule um, for a number of reasons, um, but we may consider it in the future if necessary for the species. And again, this would be a completely separate rulemaking process for opportunity for public comment. And then recovery planning is also something that we are required to undertake under the Endangered Species Act. This is a non-regulatory process. It's basically just a roadmap uh, guidance document to identify site-specific actions that we can take to help recover the species and get it off the list, because that's the ultimate goal. Um, going back to the 4D rule again, this is um, something that's completely at our discretion, and it's also something that we have to consider whether or not the United States is a considerable threat to the species. It can be very um, specific to parts of the range of the species for different threats. Um, so at this time, um, given the stability of the species in the Northwest Atlantic and the regulations that are already in place, um, we didn't see this as something we were going to undertake right now. 
So with that said, take is currently not prohibited under this listing. Um, the species is already prohibited from retention in the main fishery that catches it, the Atlantic uh, HMS pelagic longline fishery. So U.S. fishermen do not have to do anything different under current laws if and when they accidentally catch or interact with an oceanic white tip. Um, and so they will just continue to operate under all the federal fisheries regulations and RFMO measures that they're currently subject to. Um, but those fisheries, as I mentioned, may affect the ocean, that may affect the oceanic white tip will undergo Section 7 consultation. And that's it. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you, Chelsea. Sorry, that was really fast. Questions concerning the presentation on oceanic white tips? Um, seeing none, I'll call on Kirby for the technical committee response. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the TC was tasked to consider the recent status determination for oceanic white tips and provide the board any recommendations on potential management response, both for in-state shark fisheries or for vessels landing sharks taken in the EZ or transiting from the EZ through state waters. So the species is not commonly found, or the, excuse me, the species is most commonly found south of ASMFC states. Uh, NOAA uh, HMS has not adjusted the management program uh, currently in response to the new ESA status. Um, and in turn, the TC recommends consider moving the species to the prohibited species list um, once consultations are completed, uh, but until then maintaining status quo measures. Um, with that, I'll take any questions, thanks. Questions or comments? Seeing none. Um, thank you very much, Chelsea. All right, before we get to the next agenda item, which is the FMP review, I wanted to circle back to uh, Adam's motion. Um, so it's clear to the board what the schedule would be for addressing that particular um, motion. Adam, do you have suggestions as to when things should be initiated in that regard? Well, I believe the motion initiated the process today. Uh, I would have to defer to staff for what they would look at for coming up with a first draft. Uh, given the timeline of things that we heard today, I would think that if we were able to look at something in the summer and take final action on that <laughs> addendum at the winter, at the fall meeting, um, would then put us in place to respond to anything that comes out of ICAT from November at our winter 19 meeting. So again, I'd, I'd have to defer to staff to workload, but I would think if we were on track for final action at the annual meeting, that would put us in a very good place to take any subsequent action needed. I'll look to staff to see if that's a reasonable expectation. Yeah, thank you, Adam. I just wanted to get that clarified because we don't often have a Coastal Sharks meeting, board meeting in the summer meeting. We often have one at the annual meeting, but from what you've laid out, you'd, you'd prefer to have this addendum be taken up uh, at the summer meeting and then final action be considered at the annual meeting so as to respond likely in early 2019 to Amendment 11 and any potential changes coming out of the ICAT review of short fin makos. Go ahead, Adam. Uh, I would defer to the preference of staff and the board as to what the timing would be appropriate. I would put that timeline out there as, from what I've heard today, would be most desirable, but I, I'm, I wouldn't force the hand on that. Again, if the schedule for the summer meeting sets out that not really a good time for the Coastal Sharks Board and we do it at the annual meeting with final action at the winter meeting. I still think that would put us in place to have regulations in place for 2019 before the start of most of the shark fishing seasons that most states would see. Um, but again, I, I'll defer to staff and the rest of the board. Thank you, Adam. Carol? 
I would support having Coastal Shark Board meet in the summer meeting just because we are hoping to have Amendment 11 proposed rule out by that point, and that would give this board an opportunity to review and comment on that. Is there any objection to proceeding as, as Carol and Adam suggested? Staff, we okay with that? All right, got the thumbs up from the staff, so we'll, we'll proceed. Thank you for that. Um, last item on our agenda is number seven. Consider approval of the 2016 and 2017 FMP review and state compliance reports. Again, I'll call on Kirby for that presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so just so it's clear, we have two uh, years worth of compliance reports that this fishery management plan uh, review uh, contains. It's the 2015 fishing season and the 2016 fishing season. So I'm gonna go through the status of the FMP, uh, status of the stocks, status of the fishery, implementation of compliance requirements, and PRT recommendations and comments. So uh, as many of you know, uh, the Coastal Sharks uh, FMP was implemented in January 2009. Since then, there's been um, four uh, uh, addendum to the plan. I have listed here the first three. Um, the addendum four that went into place adjusted uh, uh, finning uh, requirements. Um, since that addendum, there has been no new changes to the FMP through addendum or board action. Regarding status of the stock, um, you heard earlier today updates on the Atlantic shortfin mako and sandbar uh, sharks. So I won't provide any, any new information there really. Again, for shortfin mako, the resource is considered overfished and overfishing is occurring. For sandbar, uh, the resource is still considered overfished but not experiencing overfishing. Um, and there's obviously now a new change to the oceanic white tip uh, list now under ESA. Uh, in terms of the status of the fishery, on the commercial side, commercial landings of Atlantic sh uh, large coastal shark species in 2016 were 465,000 pounds uh, dressed weight, which was about 25% uh, uh, decrease from 2015 landings and a 20% decrease from 2014 landings. Um, commercial landings of small coastal shark species in 2016 were 210,000 um, pounds a 40% decrease from 2015 landings and a 21% uh, decrease from 2014 landings. Um, 2016 uh, landings are, are considered now a new low in landings for the time series over the last nine years. Uh, and commercial landings for Atlantic uh, pelagic uh, sharks was at 239,000 uh, pounds, which rep represents an increase of about 11% from 2015 landings level, uh, but below 2014 landing level. And largely the increase in the pelagic shark landings can be attributed to an increase in commercial harvest of um, Atlantic shortfin mako. And keep in mind when I'm uh, going through these statistics, this is information that's compiled through the SAFE report, so it is encompassing uh, uh, both federal and uh, state data. Uh, next on the recreational side, uh, approximately 69,000 sharks were harvested during the 2016 uh, recreational fishing season below the 2015 uh, landings level, but similar to those uh, seen in 2013 and 2015. Uh, the non-black nose uh, small coastal sharks group comprised about 55% of that overall recreational harvest, specifically Atlantic sharp nose and bonnet heads. Next, um, regarding de minimis, uh, as many of you may be aware, for the coastal sharks FMP, uh, de minimis is, does not have a specific criteria in place. It's taken on a on a case by case basis. Uh, Maine and Massachusetts are both requesting to maintain their de minimis status uh, that they were granted previously. In terms of PRT uh, comments, uh, the PRT found all states to have regulations that were consistent with the FMP um, and the associated addenda. Um, what was noted was that for some of the compliance reports, the law enforcement sections were either missing or lacking in few uh, compliance uh, information. Again, basically this section just outlines if there's been any noted uh, cases involving um, law enforcement in the previous year. Um, so for a few states, there either was um, 
no information provided or it might have been missing um, some, some insight. Um, there are also uh, samples that are collected through a number of states, though fishery independent sampling is not uh, a requirement of the plan. Um, so the, the PRT did note that when that information is provided that it should be given um, in a little bit more standardization, um, and that's something that the, the PRT can work to provide uh, a better template for them. Um, and lastly, the PRT did note that uh, given the FMP currently deals with de minimis on a state-by-state -state basis, or excuse me, a case-by-case -case basis, um, it can create some challenges in trying to have the PRT provide any meaningful or, or specific recommendations on de minimis status, um, given that it's really a board decision. Um, but if the board chooses so, they could move to address de minimis criteria to align with other fishery management plans through the commission. Um, if, if it's the desire of the board. Uh, so with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Questions concerning the FMP review. Then I'd seen none. Is anyone ready to make a motion to recommend approval of the FMP review? Emerson? Uh, yes, I'll make that motion. Is there a second to that motion? G Sorry, Jay. You need to read that motion into the record. All right, I'll read the motion into the record. Move to approve the fishery management plan review for the 2015 and 2016 fishing season and approve de minimis requests from Maine and Massachusetts. Motion by Mr. Hasbrook, second by Dr. McNamee. And you have, oh. from, uh, Malcolm. Malcolm, do you have a comment? Um, is this for the 1516 or 1617 review? This is for both the 2015 fishing season and the 2016 fishing season. Okay, thank you. Are we ready to vote on the motion? All in favor, raise your right hand. Any any opposed? Any nulls or ex any extension or abstentions? Then the motion carries unanimously. All right. Um, one. Ad one item that came up during the review that occurred to me that perhaps there might be an opportunity for additional comment on, and that's concerning the Law Enforcement Committee. Um, I'll just direct attention to Greg Garner. Greg, by not taking emergency action at, at this particular board meeting and proceeding as as uh, suggested in Adam's motion with an addendum, which will go into effect next year. Do you perceive any law enforcement uh, challenges or crises, considering that there will, in fact, be uh, somewhat different regulations in effect in federal waters versus state waters? I wanted to give law enforcement an opportunity to weigh in on that now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think um, Kirby's going to come over and address the Law Enforcement Committee this afternoon, and we'll take that up as well and get back. Yeah, in a discussion we had with law enforcement before the meeting, uh, there may have been some misunderstandings about if a person has a highly migratory species permit and is fishing in state waters, is that person bound by the federal shark regulations while fishing in state waters. And we had some discussion about that, and um, um, I, I think we've come to an understanding with Carol's help on that, that in fact they are bound by federal regulations if they have in their possession an HMS permit while fishing in state waters. So I, that message will be conveyed to the law enforcement section this afternoon, and we'll all be on the same page in that regard. Yep. Our, uh, do we have a nominating person? Besides Chris, no. So we can make an ask first. Okay. Uh, the last item, which is not on your agenda, but that we need to take care of, is uh, nomination of a vice chair. And 
Chris Bat Savage indicated he might be willing if no one else is uh, so inclined to raise their hand. So let me, let me, in the spirit of cooperation with Chris, uh, make the offer. Would anyone like to be considered for vice chair of the Shark Board? The reason we have an opening, by the way, is um, um, Pat Gear changed jobs, and, and so we have a near, need to elect a vice chair. Is there anyone else? Seeing none, Chris, are you willing to serve as vice chair? Yes, I'll serve. Thanks. Uh, Tony? We need that in the form of a motion, please. Anyone care to make a motion in that regard? So moved. Robert? So moved. Is there a second? Doug Brady? Um, all in favor, raise your right hand. Robert Boyles seconded. Um, all opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. If there's no further business for the shark board, is there any for get the second. We didn't get that down. Can you ask for the second one? Uh, I'm sorry. Who was the second to the motion? Was it Doug Brady? Yes. Are we good, Tony? All right. Tony has an announcement. Uh, I think our business for the shark board is, is pretty much done, but go ahead, Tony. All right. Um, we're ready to adjourn. Is there any reason to keep going, or are we all in agreement that it's time to adjourn? Seeing none, uh, um, we are adjourned. Tony? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to quickly take the time to introduce a new staff member at the commission since we are a 